Americans, what if I told you that the U.S. government has actually allowed foreign dictators and secret police commanders from other countries to actually move to the United States and live in the United States? Would you think that's a little far-fetched fantasy? Sadly, it's a reality, and it's something that even shocked me. But I dug into some research and stumbled upon a lot of this information. And this video is going to be talking about some dictators in the past from Latin America and other human rights violators who are actually able to move to the United States and in some cases become permanent residents. So I'm going to go through a list which includes a former Guatemalan dictator, a former Venezuelan dictator, and a former dictator from El Salvador who were able to come and live in the United States despite horrific crimes against humanity. <laughs> The first on the list to talk about is General Jorge Ubico of Guatemala. Jorge Ubico was the dictator of Guatemala from 1931 until 1944. He came to power in 1931 in a fake election where he was the only candidate. Not much competition. And so he came to power. And he ruled as a very cruel, repressive dictator, but he was allies with the United States government and allies with the American United Fruit Company and supported a lot of harsh economic policies and work conditions in Guatemala. And he engaged in brutal repression of all critics during his 13 years in power. Many people were tortured and murdered. Despite his brutality, the United States liked him because he gave a lot of tax exem exemptions to American fruit companies like the United Fruit Company and gave them free reign to operate for cheap and could have any horrible working conditions they wanted to practice in Guatemala and he allowed these things to happen and benefited significantly by doing it financially, but became hated by the Guatemalan people. Eventually, in 1944, the Guatemalan people had enough and a revolution happened, where the critics and protesters raided and stormed the National Palace of Guatemala and forced General Ubico to resign from office, and he did. In 1944, he was exiled and kicked out of Guatemala, and he was allowed to move to the United States, and he settled in New Orleans in Louisiana, and lived there for two years until he died in 1946 at the age of 67, and died from lung cancer. The next on the list is Marcos Perez Jimenez of Venezuela. General Marcos Jimenez was the dictator of Venezuela from 1950 until 1958. His story involves in coming to power in a coup in 1948, where he and the rest of the Venezuelan military overthrew the elected government of Venezuela and overthrowing President Romulo Bentancor. And after doing so, he installed himself as president of the military junta and ruled as a repressive dictator in the 1950s. And his regime was marked by torturing and murdering critics 
And at the same time, he was also a U.S. ally, especially when it came to the oil industry and allowing American oil companies to operate in Venezuela. Eventually, in early 1958, the Venezuelan people had had enough of the brutal repression of General Jimenez and a group of soldiers in the Venezuelan army also agreed with that and sided with the protesters. So in February 1958, General Marcos Jimenez was overthrown in a military coup and Venezuela then transitioned to becoming a democracy. In 1958, following the coup, General Jimenez fled to the United States and lived in the U.S. until 1963, when the U.S. deported him and extradited him back to Venezuela. The next on the list is a former dictator of El Salvador named Colonel Arturo Armando Molina. He was the ruler of El Salvador from 1972 until 1977. Colonel Molina was a very brutal dictator who violently suppressed protests with brute military force and had critics assassinated, including priests, one of them most notable priest killed by him was Rutilio Grande in 1977. He rejected any types of reforms in El Salvador and engaged in lots of corruption and embezzlement of money. And after he stopped being leader of El Salvador in 1977, he ended up leaving El Salvador and at some time unknown, he was able to immigrate to the United States. And he actually died recently in 2021 in California. The details are murky of exactly when he moved to the United States, but he clearly died in the United States and had been living in California for some time. And he lived to be 94 years old when he died in 2000. 21. The United States government allowed this repressive tyrant, who was a U.S. ally, to live with the American public in California. Another repressive military man from El Salvador who was able to move to the United States was Carlos Eugenio Videz Casanova. Casanova was commander of the National Guard of El Salvador from 1979 to 1983, and then he was the defense minister of El Salvador from 1983 to 1989. While he was in command of the National Guard of El Salvador, the National Guard engaged in all kinds of brutality at the beginning of the civil war in El Salvador, which started in 1979. The National Guard under his command did many crimes, war crimes, including the infamous rape and murder of four American women missionaries in 1980. Four women from the United States who are Christian missionaries had gone to El Salvador on a mission trip and members of the National Guard raped and murdered these four women in 1980. And General Casanova made many attempts to try to cover it up. And then he served as defense minister after that from 83 to 89. And continued more war crimes against the Salvadoran people during the Civil War in the 80s. And when he retired in 1989, he was able to move to the United States and move to Florida and became a permanent resident of the United States. When General Casanova moved to Florida in 1989, the family of those four American women 
the missionaries who were killed by the National Guard, they were outraged when they learned that this man had moved to the United States and was living in their country. And eventually, the family of these four missionary women filed lawsuits against General Casanova. He was able to live in the United States as a permanent resident from 1989 until 2015. Eventually, these court lawsuits against him ended up resulting in him being deported back to El Salvador in 2015. And he is living there still to this day in his 80s in El Salvador. He has still not fully been held accountable for his war crimes, but it was a real shame that the United States government allowed him in 1989 to move to the United States and make him a permanent resident regarding all the war crimes that he took part in and was allowed to live with the American public. The last example I will be sharing is from Haiti, Luckner Cambron. <clears throat> Luckner Cambron was the commander of the infamous Tonton Makut. They were the secret police of Haiti under the rule of Papa Doc, Francois Duvalier. The Tonton Makut in French Creole means the boogeyman. And Luckner Cambron was the commander of the Tonton Makut during the 1950s and 1960s and was a loyal thug for Francois Duvalier Papa Doc. The Tonton Makut, under the command of Luckner Cambron, engaged in many crimes against humanity from rape to brutal killings and torture, and they also extorted the Haitian people and had free reign to terrorize all critics of Papa Doc Duvalier. Also, Luckner Cambron earned the nickname the Vampire of the Caribbean because he also ran a plasma center in Haiti collecting blood from Haitian people and selling it abroad to other countries. Really sick stuff. So Luckner Cambron eventually fell out of favor in Haiti after Papa Doc died in 1971, and Cambron wanted to make himself Prime Minister of Haiti, and the Duvalier family uh, did not want any of that, so he fell out of favor and had to leave Haiti in 1972, and he was able to move to the United States, to Florida, and he was able to... Um, have no problems becoming a permanent resident, and lived freely in Florida from 1972 until he died in 2006 at the age of 76. Luckner Cambron was a brutal, sadistic man and a sociopath, and what he did in the Tonton Makut was inhumane, and it's really horrifying that he was able to live freely in Florida, living with the American people, giving everything that he did, and he should have never been allowed to move to the United States. But somehow the U.S. government, and whoever was the governor of Florida at that time, allowed this man to settle in Florida. These are just some high-profile examples, but there are smaller people um Soldiers from different Latin American countries who did terrible war crimes, such as in Guatemala and El Salvador, who did um, brutal war crimes during the Civil Wars at the time, and were able to uh, move to the United States. In some cases, they came illegally. But these high-profile examples I gave, they were able to legally move to the United States and did all the proper paperwork and the U.S. government gave permission. So when we're talking about, you know, our broken immigration system 
in the United States. This this really takes the cake of how these people were able to legally immigrate to the United States and get top priority. Yet a lot of other people from, you know, Haiti, for example, or El Salvador, or Guatemala, uh, have a much harder time than normal people trying to legally immigrate to the United States and, you know, have much better records. And these people, these secret police people, military commanders and dictators were able to immigrate quite quickly to the United States and the U.S. government gave approval to them. This is a really big example, as I mentioned, of how broken and messed up America's immigration system is and how badly it is in need of reform and the messed up priorities of the U.S. government when it comes to immigration.